Therefore, if anyone refuses or hesitates to believe and preach, either that there are two natures, or that there is one person in our Lord Jesus Christ, or if anyone refuses to confess that the same one, that is, the Word incarnate, was truly born of the Virgin Mary for our salvation, is God and man, the Catholic faith recognizes and shows such a one to be as much a stranger as he is an ingrate who opposes the mystery of human redemption. For this is that great mystery of godliness recommended to all the faithful by the mouth of the apostle. The mystery that was made manifest in the flesh was justified in the spirit, appeared to angels, was proclaimed among the nations, was believed on this world, was taken up in glory. This is, of course, the word who was in the beginning and was with God and was God. That is the only begotten son of God and the power and wisdom of God through whom and in whom all things were made and without whom nothing was made. This same is the only begotten God, although he existed in the form of God. I stop for just a moment. Do you notice uh, this same is the only begotten God? That's the what we would in older language call the Alexandrian reading of John 1.18. Uh, the textual variant of John 1.18, monogonese theos, only begotten God, unique God, versus monogonese huios, the only begotten son. Uh, he is familiar with and utilizes the critical text reading of John 1.18. I continue. That is, he was equal in all things, the one who begat him. He possessed a unity of natural essence with him. And he was in that nature, which he, being eternal, has from the Father, that which the Father naturally is. The same one was true God, most high and immutable. He was not a different God from the Father, but instead, although the personal distiller, nor of a different power, nor of another essence. I stop just to comment. That's basically an expanded definition of homoousios from the Council of Nicaea. This same one, although he exists in the form of God, nevertheless, he did not regard being equal with God as something to be forcibly kept. I stop again. That's my interpretation of Harpagmon in the Karma Christi, Philippians chapter 2. Great to see someone 1,400 years ago, uh, 1,500 years ago, uh, reading it in the same way, understanding it in the same way. It's one of the one wonderful things about reading Athanasius or Fulgentius or, or some of these individuals. Um, with God as something to be forcibly kept, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. I stop again, by taking. That's exactly, if you read my article, and I had not run into Fulgentius when I wrote my article for CRI, the CRI Journal, 15 years ago, 17 years ago. I'm not sure how long ago it was now. I'm not even sure if it was, it may have been the late 90s. Now I think about it, so it may have been over 20 years ago. I don't know, but... By taking the form, that's exactly, I think, the key element of that text. The same one was made in the likeness of men. The same one was found to be in the human condition. In him, there could be no thought of forcibly keeping because the begotten fullness of natural equality remains in him, since he is from the Father's substance by an ineffable and eternal birth. Therefore, he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave. Thus, indeed, God willed to be man naturally, and so the Lord of all things took on a servile nature without loss of his own sovereignty. Again, exactly true. I'm to say amen. Correspondingly, having emptied himself, he compassionately accepted the form of a slave. The holy apostle of the new covenant, after being made a fit minister by God, just as he himself bears witness, also himself testifies about this form, lest any one of us who hears about the emptied Son of God should by evil thought imagine that the form in the only begotten God has lost or diminished its equality with the Father's form, and lest such a person, by following the crooked, circuitous ways of the serpent's deception, should not hold the path of right faith. To prevent this from happening, Paul clarified that emptying by removing the unclear elements when he added subsequently, by taking the form of a slave. This is, sorry, but... If you've, again, if you've read my article on this, this was, this was one of the biggest elements that I was emphasizing. Um, and it was before I ran into Fulgentius. So it is always thrilling because I was simply exegeting the text. I was seeking to be consistent with what it's saying and communicating within the parameters of the sermon illustration that it is and the, the primitive hymn in the early church. And so here you have Fulgentius saying the exact same thing um, long, before, long before I did, that's for sure. 
Therefore, the only begotten God's emptying was his taking the form of a slave, since there was no loss or diminishment of his divinity. The divine nature, to be sure, cannot be diminished or increased in any way, because it is immutable and remains always what it is. For if that true and most high God, who for our sakes became poor, although he was rich, so that he might become rich, we might become rich through his poverty, had been emptied in the sense of losing his fullness, even saying this is wicked, or had undergone some change when he accepted the form of a slave, then blessed John the evangelist would not have said about the incarnate word, and we have seen his glory, the glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word who was made flesh began to be human flesh in human reality, but in divine reality, he did not cease to be the word. For this reason, the wonderful kindness of God, the Redeemer, effectually accomplished the mystery of taking up and redeeming man because the divine majesty could never admit of any change or diminishment. This is extremely important. I can't tell you how many times in, in classes on Christology, systematic theology, this has been one of the major questions students have had about the subject of the incarnation and excellent answers being given from the text of scripture by a bishop uh, at the beginning of the sixth century. Therefore, the word of God, the very same God, the word, when he took human flesh from the flesh of his mother, did indeed receive the form of a slave in such a way that he deigned to become what he in fact became. But he did this while remaining in the form of God, that is eternal and immutable God, through that unity of person which he received the form of a slave. Indeed, when he was made in the likeness of men, he was found to be in human condition. Although in all ways he had immutable deity from the nature of the Father, nevertheless, he who was not created deigned to be created, and he who was not created but begotten from the Father willed to be born from a woman. As in this manner, the Word was made flesh, so that there might be one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who is God over all things and is blessed into the ages. Romans 9.5, again interpreted correctly by Fulgentius. He is the one true son of God and son of man, one and the same from the father without beginning, always having been the begotten God, but indeed also truly God according to the flesh, conceived and born in time from his mother. It was not that the only begotten God received an unconceived flesh, but rather God himself was conceived in that flesh in the profoundest humility. Indeed, according to the flesh, God himself was created in and from the virgin and in fact, he who had created his own mother was created from and in that flesh, the mystery of the incarnation. If, however, God the Word had become flesh and the virgin in such a way that he had not come from her, it is certain that God himself would not have possessed the substance of flesh from the flesh of his mother, but would have simply have passed through the virgin. Think about that for a second, just pass through the virgin. In such a case, he could not have accomplished the mystery of becoming the mediator for our salvation, which is what I said on the last program about what happens if you accept the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Because in that case, Christ, the Son of God, would not have, would not have confusedly united true, full humanity and divine substance in himself. Therefore, the medical remedy, as it were, the divine goodness employed was that the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, should become man, not only in a woman, but also from that woman. Without doubt, we are commanded by the prophets of God to believe and confess this. Indeed, the prophet did not keep silent about the fact that God was made man when he said, Mother Zion will say, a man, truly a man, was born in her, and the Most High himself has established her. Isaiah, also filled by the Holy Spirit, foretold the mystery of the coming incarnation of the Son of God thus, behold, a virgin will conceive in her womb, will bear a son, his name will be called Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Therefore, because the one whom the virgin conceived in her womb and bore is called God with us, we recognize that indeed God has been conceived in the virgin's womb and has been born. The gospel also says of Mary, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Joseph too, Mary's husband, with whom she did not have sexual relations and experienced corruption of the flesh, but who was the witness to, the, witness to and guardian of her sacred virginity and purest fruitfulness, is thus advised by the angel's oracle, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for what has been born in her is of the Holy Spirit. It is also shown by heaven-sent words that he, that one born in her, was made from her, for the apostle said, but when the fullness of time came, God sent his own son, made from a woman, made under the law. Likewise, as he was writing to the Romans, he established this excellent beginning of his letter in order to show that he set a true and stable foundation of faith. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called me an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, 
which he had promised to his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was made in the seed of David according to the flesh. Also in writing to Timothy, his beloved son, the flesh, he chiefly urges him with anxious affection to remember his faith, saying, remember that Christ Jesus, who was from the seed of David, arose from the dead according to my gospel. Also the angel Gabriel is found to have used this consolation when speaking of the blessed virgin herself, namely the future bearer of her creator, indeed of the creator of all things. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore that holy thing that will be born from you will be called the Son of God. I stopped just long enough, not only to take a drink, but also to point out, what's he doing? Is he giving us tradition? Is he saying, we're to believe this because this person, he's giving us scripture. What's he basing his presentation on? Scripture. That's what Augustine did, and that's what um, Fulgentius is doing. To this belongs the mystery of our salvation, because our father Abraham ordered the steward of his household to place his hand under his loins and swear by the God of heaven. One should not suppose that he did this apart from the prophetic spirit, that is to say, at the time when the chosen vessel hinted that all things happened as figures. Therefore, holy Abraham, the father of the nations, did not do this because he believed that there was already some natural union with the God of heaven in his flesh. Instead, he did this so that we, he might show that the God of heaven was going to be born as a man from that flesh, which would bring the truth from among the descendants of Abraham himself. Therefore, that truth is the one Christ, the Son of God, in the natures of divinity and flesh. In him, the oneness of person does not confuse the human and divine natures, hypostatic union, and the unconfused oneness of the nature does not make them exist as two persons. Consequently, the truth of our reconciliation and salvation remains because God, the only begotten, became true man for us. And the man who was conceived and born was none other than the only begotten God. The importance of the fact of the incarnation. Therefore, the blessed Mary both conceived and bore God the word inasmuch as he was made flesh. God the word did not insert the flesh in which he was conceived into her womb. Nor did God himself, who was to be conceived, take on the material of conceived or formed flesh apart from her. Instead, he assumed that flesh from her as he was being born. He received the nature of human flesh from and in the virgin herself, and the eternal God was temporally conceived and born according to that nature. To be sure, the virginal conception was the very act of accepting flesh, because apart from temporal flesh, that spiritual nature of the word of God that was begotten without beginning from God the Father could not have been conceived in the womb of that saint who was herself both mother and spiritual virgin. Likewise, apart from union with the word of God, flesh could in no way be engendered in the inmost virginal womb that had not been inseminated by intercourse with a man. Therefore, when God was to be conceived in her, therefore, when God, who was to be conceived in her, arrived at that very time, the nature of the virgin who conceived offered this flesh from itself. Thus, one must not imagine that there was any interval of time between the origin of the conceived flesh and the arrival of the majesty who was to be conceived. Indeed, there is one conception of divinity and flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and there is one Christ, the Son of God, conceived in both natures, so that thereafter he might begin to erase the stain of the corruption, corrupted offspring, which was seen to exist in each person who was born. Now, why the emphasis upon that, if you're familiar with the Christological controversies of that time period, that was an anti-Nestorian polemic. That was, that was an affirmation of the hypostatic union over against at least what is attributed to Nestorius, who would not use the term Theotokos, but preferred Christotokos. Section eight, we're going to read through section 13. This is a fairly lengthy section, but I wanted you to get a true flavor for what Fulgentius is talking about and how he is addressing it. For because all men are born of intercourse between male and female, then because of their very conception, they have the beginning of original sin spread upon them by that contact. 
For that sin, which is the first man incurred when he was led astray by the devil's malice, even though he was good by nature, passed into his descendants along with its punishment, that is death. A fact that holy David truly declared, saying, Behold, I was conceived in iniquities, and in sins my mother bore me. Thus, as the merciful and just Lord sought to destroy the vestiges of human iniquity, it was absolutely necessary that the Immaculate One deigned to unite an immaculate human nature to himself. By the way, the Immaculate One there is not Mary. The Immaculate One deigned to unite an immaculate human nature to himself is about Jesus. In the very act of conception, an act which ordinarily the devil was accustomed to rule as his own portion and dominion by inflicting the stain of original sin. Therefore, the only begotten God accepted the conception and birth of his human nature, a nature that he willed to assume truly and completely. May it never be that any Catholic would believe or say it, the only begotten God, who was to redeem us by his own blood in that flesh by which God himself was made man, might reject the beginnings of human conception when in fact God was going to suffer the extremes of human mortality in that same flesh while remaining immortal himself. For just as the true and living God did not lose his unchangeable and indestructible natural condition as he died in the flesh, so also the same God who was naturally infinite and eternal did not lack his natural infiniteness when he was conceived in circumscribed flesh. And when he was born in the flesh temporally, he did not lose his natural eternality in which he was the eternal God from the Father and in the Father. For by that life he wanted his death to be the death he assumed in the flesh, and that eternality had its temporal conception in his mother. Therefore, this is deep stuff. It's great. Therefore, God the Word, that is the only begotten Son of God, who is in all things, just as he himself bears witness, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, thus did not initially refuse to be conceived in flesh according to human nature, just as God, by dying in the same flesh, later paid the debt of human nature. For human nature would have been in no way sufficient and satisfactory for removing the sin of the world unless it had passed into the oneness of God, the word, not by a confusion of the natures, but only by a unity of person. Again, over against Eutychianism or Apollinarianism in various forms. To be sure, when the word became flesh by a wondrous union, he created his nature and he re that he received from us. Nonetheless, in that divine and profoundly wondrous union, the divinity of the word was not changed into flesh, and the true humanity of the word absolutely preserved the natural reality of our race. Therefore, a virgin, and one must constantly call to mind the fact that she was a virgin, both conceived and gave birth to God the word himself according to the flesh that was made in her. The one she bore was the only begotten God, the very power and wisdom of God, the radiance of eternal light and the flawless mirror of God's majesty, the image of his goodness, the splendor of his glory, and the figure of his substance. The one she bore was the one whom the unchangeable and eternal divinity of the Father begat as the eternal and unchangeable one without any beginning of his nature. The virginal womb first conceived and gave birth to this same one, God and man, complete and entire in human nature. This, I hope you see, is a very full-throated defense of the Chalcedonian formula. When, however, we say the Lord Christ is God and man, we point not to a duality of persons, but to the fact that a very true union of both natures has taken place at any mingling, i.e. the hypostatic union. To be sure, the same God who is man is the same man who is God. For human nature was wondrously united to God the Word in such a way that the true God himself would become true man. And indeed, in such a way that the true humanity, the incarnate Word, would possess no other person than the incarnate Word. For it was a human substance, not a person that was added to God. Therefore, God with his own flesh is one Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the same one at the same time, both word and flesh. Indeed, the same word is flesh, for the same God is man. But God the Word did not receive flesh in some way without becoming flesh, since the evangelist says the Word was made flesh. And the most high and most great God did not assume the nature of flesh in the way he dwelt in one of the patriarchs or prophets. In that case, God would certainly have been in that man, but God himself would not have been a man. May it never happen that the Christian conscience, conscience holds to such understanding or that anyone among the faithful permits himself to be defiled by such great ungodliness. For when the word was made flesh, divinity thus deigned to unite humanity miraculously to, himself, to itself in such a way that for the life of the world, that humanity of his 
would come into being as divine humanity in one and the same God and man, Christ, while preserving the reality of both natures. For God, not withholding his mercies and his anger, was made man for this purpose, that whatever he had created whole in man, God might make it completely whole again once he had taken it into himself. As a result, we're getting close to the end here. As a result, he possessed this marvelous quality of being both God and man because he was truly conceived and born according to the flesh. Consequently, the virgin ineffably conceived and bore the God of heaven and the virgin mother remained inviolate. After all, an angel has truthfully proclaimed that she was full of grace and blessed amongst women. Luke chapter one. Now remember, stopping for a moment, in modern Roman Catholic theology, this has now been extended beyond the birth of Christ. And so what happens is modern Roman Catholic apologists will take that later concept and read it back and insist, well, see, here's, here's the same thing we're saying at a, at a later period. As we're going to see in a moment, that don't work. By the power and work of prevenient grace, the Holy Spirit came over her and the power of the Most High overshadowed her. And she was, as she was about to conceive the one who was God and the Son of God, she neither desired nor engaged in intercourse. But instead, while maintaining her virginity in both mind and body, she received from him what she was about to conceive and give birth to by a gift of uncorrupted fertility and fertile purity. Thus did the Holy Virgin conceive God the Word as he, the creator of angels and men, was himself made according to the flesh. And the same way she gave birth to the Redeemer of men. For the Holy Virgin Mary did not conceive God without assuming his flesh or conceive flesh without its union with God because the one whom the virgin conceived belonged jointly to the, to the God of the virgin and to the flesh of the virgin. This is the grace by which it came about that God, who came to take away sins because there is no sin in him, was conceived from sinful flesh and born as man in the likeness of sinful flesh. To be sure, the flesh of Mary had been conceived in iniquity, in accordance with human practice. And so her flesh that gave birth to the Son of God in the likeness of sinful flesh was indeed sinful. This is an accurate translation. I have the Patrologia Latine uh, citation. If someone questions that, it's an accurate translation. Fulgentius said, to be sure, the flesh of Mary had been conceived in iniquity in accordance with human practice, and so her flesh that gave birth to the Son of God in the likeness of sinful flesh, was indeed sinful. The apostle bear witness, bears witness that God sent his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. That is to say, he sent the one who, although he existed in the form of God, nevertheless did not regard being equal with God as something to be forcibly kept, but emptying himself by taking the form of a slave, he was made in the likeness of men. For that reason, the Son of God, the same one who was made in the likeness of men, was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh so that he might become like men in the true flesh that he himself had created and so that God, created in the flesh without sin, might remove our dissimilarity to himself. He understood this dissimilarity in our flesh to be a result of his work, not of his work, but of our sin. Therefore, as the Son of God appeared, he was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh because human mortality was present in his true human flesh, but not human iniquity. When it is said that truly the likeness of sinful flesh is in the Son of God, or rather that the Son of God is in the likeness of sinful flesh, one must believe that the only begotten God did not take the defilement of sin from the mortal flesh of the virgin, but that he received the full reality of its nature so that the source of truth might rise from the earth, the source whom the blessed David announces in a prophetic word saying, truth has sprung out of the earth. Consequently, Mary, whom God accepted, truly conceived and bore the word incarnate. Section 14, be the last one that I read. But she gained the privilege of conceiving and bearing God-made man, not because of human merits, but because of the condescension of the Most High God who was being conceived and born from her. 
For if God the Word had not been born as a true and full human being by uniting human nature taken from the Virgin to himself in an exceptional way, he could never have been the source of spiritual birth from God for us who had been born carnally. But in order that the divine birth might be given to those who had been carnally born, the divine majesty was first conceived and born in the true flesh of the only begotten Son. For salvation was far from sinners, and our iniquities separate us greatly from God, because we were held, held bound by the fetters of death from the very moment of our fleshly birth. And because we could be set free from this death only by the blessing of spiritual birth, God was born of a man so that men might be born of God. This reason, therefore, Christ, the Son of God, that is, the true God in eternal life, was born and died in true flesh, so that we might be reborn spiritually in the one name of the Trinity through the sacrament of baptism. The apostle teaches this, saying, we who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. So, he goes on from there, but you might say, man, that was a long reading. Well, I think some of those Gnostic Gospels we read were longer than that. 